Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 110 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sobalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. One of the great things about medieval studies these days is that there is an increasing focus on areas outside of European history. Although many people, like me, still specialize in the history of England and France, for example, there are so many more resources out there from stellar scholars who are giving those of us in the English-speaking world the resources to find out more about the global Middle Ages. This is vital work, not to mention hugely interesting, so it's my great pleasure to bring you a conversation this week about a thriving and fascinating medieval Kingdom, Solomonic Ethiopia. This week, I spoke with Dr. Verena Krebs about the diplomatic and religious missions from Solomonic Ethiopia to Western Europe in the late Middle Ages. Verena is a professor of medieval history at Bochum, Germany, and has spent the last 10 years as a visiting researcher at Addis Ababa University and Mekele University in Ethiopia. She's the author of one of the most interesting books I've read this year Medieval Ethiopian Kingship, Craft, and Diplomacy. Here's our conversation on contact between Solomonic Ethiopia and Western Europe, how historians have misconstrued Ethiopian interests in the past, and what we can learn when we really dig into primary sources. Well, thank you so much for joining me to talk about Ethiopia. I'm really excited about it, and I enjoyed the book so much. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. And the scholarship on this is just great. So I'm really happy to have you talking about Ethiopia to everyone. But let us we always start at the beginning on this podcast. So starting at the beginning, a lot of the borders are different now than they would have been in the Middle Ages. So can you tell us a little bit about where Ethiopia was in terms of its borders or its general area during the Middle Ages? Mm-hmm. I mean, this this also depends on, um, of course, the time period we're looking at. So in what we would call the early Middle Ages or in late antiquity, actually, we have the kingdom of Aksum, which is in northern modern day Ethiopia and Eritrea, which is also a major Christian kingdom. Then the next couple of centuries, our source evidence becomes a little bit more scarce. But the period that I'm looking at, uh, the 15th and early 16th century, we have this massive, massive Christian kingdom that encompasses about a third of modern day, the modern day state of Ethiopia and large sections of highland modern day Eritrea. So it really is this whole highland plateau that stretches nearly from the Red Sea coast to the south of modern-day Addis Ababa. I mean, at least that's what these Solomonic Christian kings who rule the Christian kingdom of Ethiopia, that's what they claim to rule. Whether the rule was really enforced everywhere is, of course, a different matter. But so we're looking at quite the sizable kingdom, nearly a thousand miles in length and several hundred miles in breadth that is now found in modern-day Eritrea and Ethiopia. So it's vaguely the same area, but huge, huge kingdom. And I think that's important to establish at the beginning. And something you've already mentioned is that you're calling it in the book Solomonic Ethiopia and mentioning that it's Christian. So can you tell us a little bit more about why it's called Solomonic Ethiopia at this time period, at least the late Middle Ages? I mean, for the longest time, scholars thought that this was a term that was being applied by researchers onto this kingdom calling it Solomonid or Solomonic. But actually, I found quite compelling evidence that even in the 15th and 16th century, the kings of this kingdom, because they gave themselves a myth, uh, which explained where their dynasty came from, that said, well, we are the descendants of the biblical king David and the biblical king Solomon. And Solomon especially was very much on the forefront of these kings, mind in in, in sort of saying we're the true descendants through the son that King Solomon had with the Queen of Sheba. His son in the Ethiopian tradition is called Menelik, who is then appointed by the biblical King Solomon to rule Ethiopia. So that is the line that these Solomonic kings see themselves in, genealogically, spiritually, in general, in how they look at the world. And so it seems only fair to call them Solomonic Ethiopian Christian kings. And I mean, a bit of specificity doesn't hurt in general. (laughs) That's always a good thing. And speaking of specificity, it's worth noting before we get any further that this is, they are following Coptic Christianity here. So they're not following the Latin church, right? 
So Christianity came to Ethiopia when it was still the Aksumite kingdom, so a predecessor kingdom that reached the height of its power in late antiquity, so between the 4th and 6th century. And uh, in the early 4th century, one of these Aksumite kings converts to Christianity. Now, the early 4th century is, of course, prior to the development of the Coptic church, the Latin church and whatnot, because we're still in the phase of very early Christianity, right? And so when this Aksumite king converts to Christianity, he sends one of um, his clergymen, who's actually a Syrian Christian, out to Alexandria, to the Patriarch of Alexandria in Egypt, who appoints him as the metropolitan or as the spiritual head of this Aksumite church, And so even after the fall of Aksum and after all of these Mediterranean early Christian churches splinter off into different groups, the Ethiopian church or the Aksumite church still adheres to the patriarchate of Alexandria, which then becomes Coptic. So because it is such an ancient Christian kingdom, it actually predates us defining it as Coptic. But of course, then we call it a bishopric of the Coptic church but with its very own individual specific characteristics, its own calendar, its own liturgical language, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. I think that it's important to establish this, its religious context, because, I mean, that is a huge part of why Ethiopians start to travel, especially in the time period that you're looking at, so 15th and 16th century. And one of my favorite things about this the story that you tell in here is one of the first ones where I think is a Venetian shows up, a European shows up in Ethiopia, and they're suspicious of him as actually being a true Christian. And so they, they question him about articles of faith. And I think this is really important because I think in general terms, when people talk about Africa in the Middle Ages, it's assumed to all be Muslim. And this is actually the Christianity of Ethiopia is a huge part of his identity, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, it's uh, so, um, I mean, we'll get to this later, but uh, the way that these Solomonic Ethiopian diplomatic missions to Latin Europe that are being sent out throughout the late Middle Ages, the way that they start off is literally with this stranger, he's called a, a French, so it's a, a Frank, who gets apprehended while he's trespassing and he's brought before the Ethiopian king. And the Ethiopian king, Dawit, is like, oh, well, better check who these strangers are and whether they're lying about being Christian. So he quizzes them about the fate of the true cross, which is a very (laughs) specific religious quiz, if you will. And so ensuring that uh, the people who are saying that they're Christian are really Christian is a fundamental importance to uh, these Ethiopian kings and also to the sense and to the way they perceive their role in the world as well. But it's also worth, because you mentioned this image we might still have of a wholly Muslim medieval Africa or Northern Africa. It's really worth remembering. Solomonic Ethiopia in the 15th century might have been the only sovereign Christian kingdom, but there's still substantial Christian communities in Nubia, in the Nubian kingdoms, and in Egypt itself. So there are, especially in Northeast Africa, lots and lots of Christian communities until the late Middle Ages and actually even much, much later, of course. And their identity, like we're talking about, is wholly formed as being a separate thing from, you know, the papacy and things like this. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. The Pope is, um, I think in the book I call him the head of a schismatic or heretical um, Western group somewhere off to faraway Europe and faraway West, yeah. That's right. And there are moments where kings just choose to ignore the Pope and the rulers of Europe. So let's get into the actual voyages that the Ethiopians are sending out, delegations that they're sending out. So we have this Frank shows up and they're intrigued. I think you say in the book that they're intrigued by this story of the Holy Cross. And that's kind of what touches off some of the diplomatic missions. So what's this first diplomatic mission that Dawit sends? What's it like? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, one of my favorite anecdotes about it is that it part of that mission are four live leopards that get shipped off to Venice. Um, (laughs) So one of these strangers that gets apprehended, and we later know his name from uh, Venetian documents. So he's called Antonio Bartoli. He's a native of Florence, actually. 
And so the uh, Ge'ez, the local Ethiopian source, tells us that the Ethiopian king Dawid promised him a rich reward if he went out to his country, which is all of Franklin in the Ethiopian <laughs> conception. So if he went out to all of Franklin to get the Ethiopian king also a piece of the true cross, because, I mean, if all of these Western Christian kings had shared uh, splinters of the true cross amongst themselves, Dawid also wanted one for his own kingdom. Why not? You know, it's uh, partaking in, a, in an exchange of precious relics. So he sends out this Florentine man and uh, he travels from the Ethiopian highlands on that very well-established, very routine trade and pilgrimage route that we find. So it's from the Ethiopian highlands to the Red Sea, then sailing up the Red Sea towards the modern day um, Sudanese Egyptian border and then crossing the desert so that you hit the River Nile directly after the cataracts. And then you can just sail along the Nile until you go to basically the Mediterranean coast. And so we know that he sails along this route or he travels along this route and from there makes his way to what is called uh, the kingdom of uh, Bendekeya in the Ge'ez text, which is the city of Venice, where he meets a certain Negusa Michele, a certain king called Michael, who is Michele Steno, the Venetian doge. <laughs> I love this because it's so nice to see those really common places in Europe like Venice, to see it from the other side, to see it from people who are discovering it for the first time. So they bring these leopards to Venice. And what's the reception like? They're bringing other things I should mention, but the, the leopards are a great part of the story. So what is the reception like for them in Venice? Um, lots and lots of excitement. So one of the really charming things is, of course, you get all of this local correspondence between Venetian nobles and, and high dignitaries who are really excited about these live leopards and the challenge of ferrying them about. But you also get excited letters where it's like, oh, I heard that this ambassador of Prester John, and we can talk about him uh, in a minute, so that this ambassador of Prester John has come and he has the most marvellous, most exciting, most wonderful strange things with him. And I want to see these strange things. And please, please, can you send me these strange things so I can look at them and enjoy them? So from everything we can reconstruct in the Venetian sources, the reception was quite ecstatic. We also know that the Venetian city administration actually uh, designates a considerable amount of money to purchase gifts to send to Ethiopia in turn. So it seems to me that the reception wasn't just very positive and, and, and full of excitement, but also that there was a clear interest of the Venetians to ensure very good relations with the Ethiopian kings in the future. It doesn't come to that. But the Venetian sources really strongly indicate that uh, there was a strong Venetian interest to make sure that for the future, everything would be could be possibly done to ensure that one could be on terms with this kingdom that has suddenly uh, sort of sent out its ambassador to Venice. Yes, I think that's really important to establish their reception because I do think that so often there is this leftover ideas of colonialism where people who look different in the Middle Ages were treated with suspicion or they were treated as, you know, lesser or things like that. And here we have this delegation coming from this kingdom being treated as a delegation from a kingdom and wanting to establish these very good trade relations with them. So I think that's really important to establish. Yeah, and I mean, that's a pattern we find. So just uh, two years later, um, the Ethiopian King Dawid sends out an, or has sent out another mission that arrives two years later in 1404 in Rome, where three Ethiopian monks are actually hosted by the Cardinal of Aquileia in Rome at his residence. And we have this beautiful, very cute description. And it's it's told through the eyes of an Italian cleric who says, oh, there's now these three black Ethiopian monks who've come here. They're very good Christians. They are apparently the people of Prester John. They come from the king of Prester John. And isn't that exciting? Uh, isn't that wonderful? And everybody wants to talk to them. We're gathered in a room. We're reading to them from John of Hildesheim's Historia Trieregum. So basically a fictional text about the Prester John and then sort of trying to learn everything about their people. And uh, you can feel the excitement of these Italian humanists at yet another mission that then later comes. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think this is probably a good time to talk about who Prester John was, because this is something that that is throughout in the sources that you found when people are talking about Ethiopia, at least the people from Latin Christendom talking about Ethiopia, talking always about Prester John, no matter who is the king of Ethiopia at the time. So can you tell us who Prester John was in the medieval imagination? Uh, I mean, Prester John seems to be the phantom that uh, is found in European ideas about the larger Christian world. It's this very prominent figure whose origin actually harkens back to a fake letter written in the 12th century to several European sovereigns and the Pope. And in this fake letter um, of the 12th century, he elaborates that, you know, I am the strongest Christian king of the world. I am of a country of immense riches, literally the kingdom where milk and honey flows and there's jewels just lying in the riverbeds. And I have this ginormous army at my disposal and I am not just a good Christian king, I am also a priest. So I am the embodiment of the ideal Christian true ruler. The only catch was that one didn't quite know where he was. And I mean, we now know as historians that this was a hoax. But within medieval Europe, this causes quite the frenzied search for Prester John. And this is the context in which a lot of these 13th century missions to the Mongols from the papacy, but also from different European courts must be understood. So in the 13th century, European contemporaries still search for Prester John largely in Asia. But with the beginning of the 14th century, they, the, the gaze gradually shifts southwards because there had also been this awareness of this Christian kingdom south of Egypt. And you can see how in the 14th century, these two start to converge and overlap slowly. I mean, it's a, it's a gradual process. But throughout the 14th century, um, European contemporaries become increasingly convinced that this Christian kingdom south of Egypt must be finally the people of Prester John, so that by the time the first Ethiopian mission finally arrives, everybody's excited and ecstatic because by that point, European contemporaries have convinced themselves, this is now Prester John. It must be true. We've been looking for 200 years, right? <laughs> Yes. And I mean, they are showing up with lavish gifts, right? They're showing up with gifts that are jeweled and things like that. So it sounds like it makes sense. <laughs> it, it definitely makes sense. And I mean, even, uh, uh, I mean, translation is a big issue as well. But I, I guess uh, things get lost in translation and things get misunderstood. I mean, in the 15th century, actually, of course, the Solomonic Christian kings, they're a powerful Christian kingdom ruling a large kingdom in the Horn of Africa. So absolutely, they are sovereign Christian rulers who are sometimes actually also using extreme amounts of violence against their Muslim tributaries, not necessarily because they're fighting a crusade, but because they see these tributaries as tributaries that are not fulfilling their requirements, they're not paying their tribute. So what gets then relayed to Europe is this sort of funhouse mirror image where you have a Christian king who is sometimes fighting Muslims and winning and who is rich and sending these embassies. So it, it sort of it helps to confirm these European ideas. And it takes a long time for these European ideas and fancy imaginings to actually slowly be replaced by a more realistic picture. Absolutely. And I think this is something you've really done well in the book by looking at sources on both sides, the sources that are coming from Ethiopia, the sources that still exist in Ethiopia, as well as the European sources as well. So King Dawit sending these embassies out and he's sending them peer to peer, like I'm a king, you're a king, and he's asking for things from them. So what kind of things is he asking for to be sent back to Ethiopia? So what we definitely know that he must have asked, because it's in the Venetian records, is that he must have asked for foreign craftsmen. He must have asked for specialist craftsmen from Venice and very specific craftsmen as well. So a painter, a carpenter, a bricklayer, a stonemason and a, a swordsmith or an armorer. But we also know that uh, what gets brought back to Ethiopia, because we have a, a source who tells us the aftermath of this embassy, is just loads and loads and loads of beautiful ecclesiastical garments and liturgical items, 
all sorts of precious things, but also um, rain clothes and tent fabrics and just everything that you could possibly hope to get if you were a sovereign, powerful Christian king interacting with another powerful Christian entity and you wanted to obtain some very foreign exotic luxury goods from a very distant place. And I mean, in this case, the foreign distant exotic place is Europe, not (laughs) Ethiopia. I think that's important. And that's something that you mentioned in in some of the sources, the way things have been written historically from a European perspective in the last 100 years, 150 years have said that the Ethiopians are looking for a technology because they don't have technology. But what you're what you've proved is that they're looking for a different aesthetic. So they're not asking for these technicians because they don't have them. They're looking for a different aesthetic. Is that right? Yeah, so that's an important thing. And I mean, it's it's because there's a recurring pattern as well, because um, Dawit's sons universally also send out their own embassies and they're requesting the very same things like their father. So they're also requesting artisans, but specifically building related labor, because we have all of these little notes in European archives that then specify that they requested a painter or a bricklayer or a carpenter. So that's not really technology, is it? Um, yes. And and I mean, why would you ever classify that as technology in the first place? <laughs> it's it's a painter, right? But they're also requesting, or they're they're also um, trying to obtain relics, especially which is about as far removed from technology or warfare as you can be. They're requesting these beautiful, sumptuous fabrics, ideally with this Christian embroidery, and these very foreign and exotic objects from the Latin West to come to Ethiopia, which makes a lot of sense because at that time, the Ethiopian kings were building monumental churches and monasteries throughout the highlands that were basically signaling to their own people their Christian faith and their splendor and their greatness, right? So obtaining all of these foreign, exotic, beautiful things from abroad would have built monuments to their universal Christian faith. So I I talked to, uh, he's such a lovely person, Peter Brown, um, the other day, who who made the point to me that nowadays we tend to always associate the um, state with warfare and sort of these dramatic militaristic things. But actually, uh, for the longest time, you needed to have beautiful monuments to give your people also something to aspire to or, or, or feel that this was something you would fight for or this is something that really you could identify with. And in case things got bad, that you would then fight for to keep with you, right? So I think that's a very important point to, to make, that things of beauty actually held an immense amount of power in a pre-modern world. Yeah, and it's very easy to see if you look at the European examples, there are all sorts of things that you find that are associated with religious worship that are beautiful. They've come from the Far East, right? They're silken textiles and things like that, because the very fact that they've come from a long way away is what makes them beautiful. And it's exactly the same thing that's happening in Ethiopia. Yes, so it's exactly the same thing that's happening in Ethiopia. And also, I mean, what is particularly galling, if you will, uh, that this was... I think, misread by scholarship for such a long time and for very, I think, for reasons stemming back to colonialism and very specific 20th century notions about European-African encounters. But what is particularly galling is also, I mean, if you read anything about Ethiopian 15th century, 16th century history, this is a very successful military, a kingdom that is militarily very successful and able to defend itself. And it's also, it's right on this motorway of pre-modern trade. So you could obtain all the arms and the quote-unquote technology that you wanted from either the Indian Ocean world or the Eastern Mediterranean. You wouldn't need to send your ambassador to Venice to get them. I mean, that's a, <laughs> that would be a very roundabout way. I mean, that doesn't even really make sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I appreciated this book because I think whenever people talk about contact as always being for military reasons, I think that's too simplistic because culture is just so much more than just, you know, we need to conquer these people. But there were communications that had to do with the military and they didn't go the way that these colonial historians imagined. So who was asking for military help at this time in these communications? <laughs> 
That is the second most galling thing. <laughs> because European sovereigns read the Ethiopian kingdom as the kingdom of Prester John, it's no great leap that their immediate reaction was, well, not only is this the world's most powerful and wealthiest sovereign, he is the grandest Christian fighter in the world. And uh, so it's it's no big surprise that in the 1520s, King Alfonso V of Aragon, who himself was actually, I mean, he was not an unimportant king in the Western Mediterranean at the time. And he is actively looking for military aid and financial aid from Ethiopia. And the papacy throughout the 15th century is heavily interested in convincing the Ethiopian rulers to join a crusade against both the Mamluks of Egypt and later also the Ottomans in the Balkans. So, I mean, it is actually, it's the complete opposite. It's it's European uh, sovereigns, potentates, the Pope, the papacy, that is heavily interested in trying to convince the Ethiopians to join a crusade and help them out militarily. But it wasn't all that necessary for the Ethiopians to take on the Mamluks because they were allowing, the Mamluks were allowing them to make their pilgrimages to Jerusalem and things like that. It was not really necessary or in their best interest to actually yeah, attack yes. the Mamluks. I mean, this is a whole different field of study that is thankfully currently seeing a lot of new research uh, by colleagues, especially based in France. But so Solomonic Ethiopia and Mamluk Egypt, two kingdoms or sultanates that are coeval largely because they both come to power in the mid 13th century and they both lose their power in the early 16th century. These two realms had very cordial and good diplomatic relations in their own right. I mean, it's sometimes you have, I don't know, a few years where a specific Mamluk sultan and a specific Solomonic king are not on the best of terms, and it's a very macho encounter where everybody's threatening <laughs> the other. But, I mean, a few years down the line, you see that cordial relations are resumed and you have tracks of up to 3,000 Ethiopian Solomonic pilgrims making their way through Mamluk Egypt where they're enjoying freedom of travel and actually the Mamluk authorities repeatedly allow them to visit, for example, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem free of charge. So they're getting even special preferential treatment by the Mamluk authorities in both Egypt and in Palestine. Why would you want to upset this relationship just to ally with these Christians in the far west? I mean, as I keep saying, Ethiopian geopolitics are not Latin Christian politics. It's, it doesn't make sense from an Ethiopian Christian perspective at all. No, absolutely not. Because why would you fight with your neighbor over someone who's much further away? As you say, it doesn't make any sense. But let's come back to the pilgrims for a minute, because I think this is important and something I hadn't realized, is that Ethiopians had an established center in Jerusalem for their own worship and that pilgrims were going back and forth there as well as to other places in Europe. So can you talk a little bit more about how just individual Ethiopian pilgrims were traveling at this time? So um, as you said, they had uh, like Ethiopian uh, monasteries or Ethiopian pilgrimage uh, hostels or support networks throughout the Levant, but also in the Eastern Mediterranean, in Cyprus and Rhodes. But also we can trace the routes that individual Ethiopian pilgrims took in the 15th century from Venice all the way north of the Alps, even to modern day Germany or to the very west of the Iberian Peninsula, to Santiago de Compostela. They always appear or sort of like in, in small little pragmatic documents, but we can really see how Ethiopian um, monks, especially in small groups of three to five make their way at a very leisurely pace, actually. <laughs> I love that. And one thing that I hadn't realized, of course, there's lots of scholarship that's been showing that you have people from Africa in art, in European art at this time. And one of the most famous books of ours of the time has what looks like Ethiopian pilgrims in it. Can you tell us a little bit about where they appear? Yes, so they appear in um, one of the Limburg brothers' famous book of hours, the illuminated book of hours, the Très Rigeur um, du Duc de Berry. So it's uh, a very prestigious uh, manuscript or illuminated manuscript that was begun by the Limburg brothers 
in the early 15th century. It was completed much later because they die, presumably of the plague. But one of these folio length or folio size depictions actually shows three Ethiopian or three black monks, which was painted before the death of the Limburg brothers. So it must have been painted before 1416. And we know from a variety of documents that at that very time, we have three Ethiopian monks who get described in a very similar manner in how they're displayed in this painting or in this uh, miniature. We can locate them in Constance in modern day Germany, but also in Geneva in modern day Switzerland. So it wouldn't be too huge of a leap of faith, I think, because we know that these monks were traveling all over the place, that they might have even made their way into into Burgundy or, or where they might have, I don't know, either encountered the Limburg brothers or tales of how they looked like and what they did and what they wore, how they presented themselves might have reached the Limburg brothers. Yes, I like that. And I think you've described it very well in the book, how they, the pictures of these monks show them how they, they would have been wandering around Europe where they have their robes, they are carrying crosses, and they also have a brand in the middle of their forehead or some scarification that shows mm -hmm. their status as monks. Yeah, I mean, this is a bit of speculation on my part, of course. But I mean, what are the chances that you would have in this general vicinity? So basically close to the modern day area of Germany, Switzerland and France, that you would actually have three Ethiopian monks at the very time that the Limburg brothers paint such a depiction that mirrors nearly perfectly the way contemporary Europeans tend to describe these Ethiopian pilgrims. Yeah, it's a beautiful image. And I think you mentioned in the book, too, that uh, the Duke, the Duke of Berry, sent a delegation to Ethiopia around this time as well, but they didn't make it back. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's another that's another tidbit of information that uh, sort of has come out, because we do know that the Duke de Berry sends an embassy to Ethiopia, which doesn't, well, not everybody who gets sent out makes it there. And the one person who actually does make it there uh, apparently switches allegiance and then acts as an agent for one of the Ethiopian Solomonic kings. And we find him later in the Eastern Mediterranean, where he's once again trying to convince foreign artisans to accompany him back to Ethiopia. So it's a, it's a, the, the source in question through which we know about this has its own convoluted transmission history. But all things being equal, there's a lot that hints at the Duc de Berry sending out a mission around this time in the mid 1410s to Ethiopia that then later sort of falls apart or some of the delegates die and the one that actually survives switches allegiance and, you know, uh, gets re-employed. <laughs> it's too bad sometimes. I think that history would be very different if it was maybe a little easier to get to Ethiopia because there are some missions that you mention in the book that fall apart because of that huge distance. And one of the things that I think had to do with distance, but it might have to do with the fact that Alfonso was asking for military aid, was actually a proposed double wedding between the Ethiopians and the Spanish at this time. So what was the end game, do you think, for this marriage proposal between Ethiopia and Spain? That's a really interesting question. So in the 1420s, the Ethiopian king Yishak sends this embassy to the court of Alfonso V, and his ambassadors arrive in Valencia, where Alfonso is incredibly excited that they're there. He's very excited to hear from the Ethiopian king. He's putting together his own little mission to send back to Ethiopia, but he's also treating the Ethiopian ambassadors with high honors and, and, and readying everything they requested of him. And uh, we can see that even two years later, Alfonso is still very much invested in hearing back from the Ethiopian Highland Court, whether there might be a royal match and not just one royal match, but actually a double marriage, right? The problem here is that with this particular mission or these two missions that are then sent out from Valencia to Ethiopia, they both die. Well, the people who are involved in the <laughs> missions uh, mostly meet a rather gruesome end because uh, a lot of different things go awry. And so it all comes to nothing. I mean, the question would also be how this could have potentially, like whether the distance between these two kingdoms wasn't acting also as 
a sort of positive buffer because the realities, I guess, of what such a match would have been like might have been quite complicated. Because we know, for one, um, many of the Ethiopian kings actually practice polyamory. So I don't know whether Alfonso would have been happy to give an Aragonese princess to be married as the second or third wife of Yishak. But uh, I mean, it never it never came to this. But uh, yeah, it, it's still interesting to see that not only were these two kings encountering one another at eye level, but actually it seems that Alfonso was seriously invested and super eager to tie himself to these Solomonic kings. Yes, and I think that's one of my favorite parts in the book where Alfonso sent me a letter and then he's sending another one. <laughs> it's like when you can't get someone to stop texting you, you know, in the Ethiopian yeah, kings yep, like... Yep. I'm not interested, especially because he's asking for military aid. And, and one of the things you mentioned is the king might have just been busy at that time because he was dealing with, I think, the Mamluks at the time and not super interested in getting involved in anything else. And I think that really speaks to that really established kingly identity that, again, I think gets lost in these colonial histories of places where the king's like, I am too busy to talk to you right now. <laughs> and Alfonso's yeah. saying, please. <laughs> yes, I mean, this is this is really, uh, like, this is also later. So Yeshak's younger brother comes to the throne, King uh, Zara Yaakov, who really is the man most deserving of his own Netflix series that I've ever come across because <laughs> everything about his rule is just oh my God, this could fill <laughs> like seven Game of Thrones-like seasons. It's astounding. But so this king then in the 14, he rules from the 1430s to uh, the 1460s. So it's a very long rule. And in that time, both Alfonso, but also several popes try to enter into contact with him. And he's just very busy. He's, I mean, <laughs> leading wars, campaigns. Uh, he's writing his own religious books. He is heading several translation movements. He's convening his own ecumenical councils. He's just, you know, doing a lot, really a lot. And in the midst of all that, he seems to get a bull, uh, the bull of the union from the Latin papacy. And we know that he literally files it away. So he <laughs> yeah. gets it. And he looks at it, and we know later that it was just put in the Solomonic archive. Um, <laughs> so, you know, like it, it's a bit like uh, live, when you're texting somebody and they're leaving you on red, so you're seeing these <laughs> sort of double check marks. They've received the message, but nothing is forthcoming. And I love that because there would be no one in the Latin part of Europe that would have dared to ignore the Pope like that, but the king is just like, not interested. <laughs> not no, interested. No, no, not getting into that. And also, why should he enter into a church union with the Latin church? I mean, he's literally holding his own church councils in the Ethiopian highlands. Why would you change that? Absolutely. Why would he subjugate himself? He doesn't need to do that. Doesn't want to do that for sure. No, definitely a man encountering the world on his very own terms. <laughs> I love that. And I think that that is what makes this such an important book is that you get at, especially Ethiopian kingship, how they're encountering the world on their own terms. So for people who are doing research in medieval studies right now, what would you say to them about kind of unwinding this colonialist history and finding these other nations dealing with Europeans on their own terms? What kind of advice would you give them about how to do that? Whew, that's a really tough question. Um, <laughs> I know it's, it's a big question. <laughs> oh, it's such a, it's so hard to divest from this. And it's also, especially if you're a junior scholar, to to realize, first of all, that there might be something to divest from. Because mm. uh, the, the insidious thing about many narratives is that you don't necessarily recognize them as maybe colonialist in nature. So uh, in this specific case, it is something that trickled down over the decades and if you trace it, this belief that the Ethiopians were looking for military support and that they were looking for te European technology, whatever that is, that comes into play in the 1940s and in Italian scholarship that, of course, was anything but apolitical because the Italians had just tried to colonize again Ethiopia and failed again. And uh, the insidious thing is in the 1940s in these articles that get written, it's clear to still recognize the colonialist undertones, 
but it sort of gets watered down over time until you don't long any longer have this very colonialist narrative. You just have this established belief that this makes sense, even though it isn't in the sources anymore. And it takes such a long time to say, well, actually, why are we still saying this if it isn't in any of the sources that we find? Why is this belief even still around? Does it exist if it isn't in the sources? And it took me 12 years to come not to the conclusion, because I always, it, it never made sense for me, right? I wrote my MA thesis on this. I wrote my PhD on this. I wrote a 220,000 word book draft on this. And then I binned them all and sat down at the beginning of the pandemic last year and just wrote the thing from scratch again and said, you know, like, finally, I think I, I can say, or I'm convinced that this narrative that is so prevalent doesn't have any basis in the sources and therefore it needs to be dismantled. But it took a long time. And so I really don't know what advice to give beyond, <laughs> I don't know, maybe follow your gut and, and sort of arm yourself with sources and citations to, to show why you think this is right. But it, it is very intimidating. And it, especially if the colonialist narrative or origin is hidden, or has been watered down over time. It's just, yeah, it, it's particularly hard to even first recognize it as a colonialist narrative that needs to be dismantled. Oh, I think this is very good advice, actually, going straight back to the sources themselves and seeing what they say and having the guts to do that, which is something that I think is commendable because I think this book is actually going to make a change in the scholarship. So I'm so happy that you let me read it so that I can speak to you on the podcast about it. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. And I'm, I'm, I'm really excited um, to talk about it. I mean, I'm still like, part of me is still scared that I might have missed something. But I mean, mm -hmm. 12 years of research, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite a while to keep thinking about this material. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy it's out in the world. And maybe 20 years down the line, some very young, well, now probably a toddler, but then a grad <laughs> student uh, would say, you know, like back in the day, Krebs missed something or we need to amend Krebs's thesis a bit. But I don't know, this is my opening salvo to what I think the scholarship should move towards. Yeah. Well, everyone needs to take a first step. And even if in 20 years you think, oh, I missed something, the first step needed to be taken. So thank you so much for taking it. And I hope that the people who are listening will dig in more, not only into this book, but into the other nations, the global Middle Ages, so that we get a better picture of the whole period. So thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. To find out more about Verena's work, you can visit her website at verenakrebs.com. That's V E R. E-N-A-K-R-E-B-S dot com. Or you can follow her on Twitter at Krebs Verena. That's K-R-E-B-S-V-E-R-E-N-A. Her fascinating book is Medieval Ethiopian Kingship, Craft and Diplomacy, and I highly recommend it. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's new this week, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, in the UK, things are starting to get back and open and a little bit back to normality there. And that means museums are opening. And this week, the British Museum is starting its Thomas Beckett exhibition, which was supposed to actually run, I think, last October. And it kept on getting delayed and delayed, but it is now starting up. So we've got some news about that. It sounds like it would be a really kind of fun thing for people to go attend if you're in London or anywhere in the UK. You want to take the trains <laughs> over there. So we've got news on that. We've got a couple of pieces related to clothing. We have uh, Lucy Lemonnier talking about secondhand clothing in southern medieval France. So like from the people that sell it to being given in wills and marriage dowries, things like that. So it's very kind of interesting. And also we have the bit, uh, a piece on sumptuary laws in medieval Florence because the Florentines were always trying to get the women to not dress well. So, and <laughs> not dress well. <laughs> and the women, and the women were coming up with great ways of getting uh, underneath these laws and, you know, inventing like animal skins. It's not, it's not fur. This is like jaguar or something. <laughs> or you just make up an animal, right? Like this is this is the fur from this animal. So it's not prohibited. <laughs>
Oh, you know, I love sumptuary laws. Well, that all sounds awesome. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Thank you to all of our patrons on patreon.com for your help keeping the medieval podcast going. It's your support that makes this possible, so it is most appreciated. Patrons can choose from all sorts of great stuff like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, membership in our book club, and our amazing maps by Tina Ross. To find out how to become a patron of the Medieval Podcast, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from cross-cultural contact to couture, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books, including Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, at your favorite online bookstores. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an awesome day. Music